Hello, and it's time for the Raw Review here on Wrestling With Regret. Well, night two of the 2020 draft has wrapped up, and we're getting a bit of a clearer picture as to what the future holds for both Raw and SmackDown. So, let's begin. The show begins with Randy Orton cutting a promo in the ring. He concedes that 2020 has been the year of Drew McIntyre, but last week he handed Drew his first pinfall loss in nearly a year and hopes to do the same thing at Hell in a Cell. Before he can finish reciting his letters, though, Drew McIntyre himself interrupts and says that Orton missed his opportunity to punt him last week when he had the chance, and that, you know, at Clash of Champions, he punted Orton for all the guys he'd screwed over over the years, and at Hell in a Cell, he's going to beat up Orton for himself. And so he's made this mission that all night he's going to make Make Orton's life a living hell. So he gets in the ring, he fights with Orton, Orton escapes. We're not done with these guys yet, but that's pretty much the gist of this opening segment. Drew is chasing after Orton and he wants to fight. Night two of the draft officially begins here. Stephanie McMahon on stage to announce that Raw keeps Randy Orton and Charlotte Flair, but they get Bray Wyatt, the Fiend. That's a pretty big get for them. SmackDown keeps Bailey, but they also gain the Raw Tag Team Champions, the Street Profits, which means that uh, they've swapped the Tag Team Champions. New Day on Raw. Raw, Street Profits on SmackDown, and they literally just traded the belts off later on backstage, which I thought was, that's the most clear-cut way of doing it, but still, it's such a confusing thing to do because it, it automatically just messes up a lot of the lineage for those respective belts. Considering that, like, a lot of tag belts over the last, like, two decades on, on in WWE have had really messed up lineages, it feels like really confusing timelines, this does not help with that. Also, New Day and Street Profits just gain another, uh, you know, another Another tag team championship reign by virtue of them trading the belts. So you know it just all seems kind of meaningless in that way. I'm excited to see you know some new combinations with you know the tag team champs on different brands and everything. The Street Profits especially have been on Raw for so long now they need some new blood. So yay on that I guess. Your first actual match of the evening is a no DQ match as Kevin Owens takes on Aleister Black. It's a big brawl from the get go. They go outside. They're inside. At one point Aleister tosses Kevin off the bear barricade through the announce table before a commercial break. Alistair with a meteora from the top rope to Kevin threw a bunch of tables set up, or not tables, chairs set up in the ring. Kevin still kicks out. He ends up winning the match after hitting Alistair with a powerbomb through a table in the ring and pinning him. It was a pretty darn good match, and if this is the blow-off, I think it's an appropriate way of doing it. In round two of the draft, Raw has taken three people from SmackDown. They've taken Braun Strowman, which makes sense. He's been on Raw so much lately already, as it is. Then you've got Jeff Hardy and Matt Riddle all coming to the fold on the Red Show. Meanwhile, SmackDown retains Daniel Bryan. I love that Stephanie threw a little B-plus player dig at him when she, when she announced him. And then Kevin Owens, which, to be honest, I had forgotten which show he was actually on lately. It's time for Miz TV. The Miz and John Morrison have been drafted to Raw, and their guests are some other new Raw participants. You've got Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke who have new tag team music now. Good for them. Uh, Mandy calls out Miz for you know really punishing Otis by getting her traded to Raw initially. But Miz says, you know, you're so successful now, you should be patting us on the back, like literally leaving their backs in to be patted, but they're not having any of it. Miz wants to try and stir the pot between these two when it comes to the Battle Royal later, but they're both very like friendly. There's no jealousy. May the best woman win. Out come Natalia and Lana. And Lana says that they should be the ones on Miz TV because they're so much more successful. And Mandy says if they spent as much time training as they were on TikTok, maybe they'd win some more matches. They has fight, and that's where that ends. But we go to commercial break, and Miz TV is still happening. I guess it's the first time I've ever seen that talk show segment take over two segments on a single show. But anyway, you know, John Morrison is the new backup guest, and so he's putting himself over. But then suddenly, close your DMs, ladies, because here comes Lars Sullivan. The man made a big return last Friday on SmackDown after months and months and months off television comes back in a big way here, doing more of the same of what he did on Friday. He wrecks Morrison in the ring while The Miz looks on on the ramp. I can't wait for another eight weeks of this before he finally has some squash matches and then finds some new way to fuck everything up again. Backstage, we get the aforementioned belt trade-off between The New Day and The Street Profits when suddenly in come Rugler. That's my new name for Dolph Ziggler and Bobby Roode. I'm not doing Rudolph anymore. It's Rugler. Anyway, they want a shot at the Raw Tag Champions since they beat The Street Profits in the six-man last week. So the new Raw Tag Team Champions, not the ones they actually beat, except the challenge. Got it? Good. In round three of the draft, Raw select Retribution, which makes no sense. Why would you willingly keep on this group of guys who's 
sole mission has been to destroy the company. Yes, stay on here so we can keep paying you money to beat us up and destroy property. That makes all the sense in the world. Raw also keeps Keith Lee, but they also gain Alexa Bliss. So now finally, she and The Fiend can be together again. You love to see it. Meanwhile, SmackDown selects Lars Sullivan and King Corbin. They can have them. It's time for Seth Rollins' farewell address to Raw. The entire Seth Rollins, Murphy, Mysterio family storyline has been drafted wholesale to SmackDown, but before they can keep that train wreck going on the Friday show, Seth has to say goodbye to his fans here. He says that Raw is losing a champion, a beast slayer, a purveyor of the greater good, and gosh darn, a good leader too. So he, uh, he questions out loud who can step up and take his place as the leader of the Raw locker room. Out comes Jeff Hardy and Seth throwing some serious shade at him, tells him he should worry more about his match with Lars Sullivan later this week. He goes to leave when AJ Styles shows up and then he attacks, he takes a shot at Rollins as well saying, it was never Monday Night Rollins here, but Seth takes offense to that. He confronts AJ when Jeff attacks them both and makes a challenge for, in his words, a triple threat tag team match. So the match is happening now. You've got Hardy, Styles, and Rollins, which the combination on paper feels like kind of a dream match scenario. You have two guys in like Styles and Hardy who kind of paved the way for guys like Rollins in that kind of smaller guy super athletic, high risk kind of style that Rollins really perfected. And so I think that it's really cool to see this match. Like I think this is something you could, in a perfect world, build for something like on a pay-per-view or for a couple of weeks time, but we get it here on Monday. It's a pretty good match here. At one point, Styles almost steals the win after Jeff hits Rollins with the Swanton. Jeff hits the twist of fate, but then is El Cabong from behind by a returning Elias. We've not seen him in several months. So AJ pins Jeff to win the matchup, and Elias is back. Uh, he makes it know later in the show he wants to get payback on Jeff for hitting him with a car in a drunken state many months ago, which I'm like, wait a minute, I thought we had already established that Jeff was framed in that and that it was clearly Seamus who set him up, which now that I think about it, Seamus never got any kind of consequence for being involved in that. But Elias is adamant that it was Jeff who hit him, so he's going to attack him and make his life a living hell. He also plugs his upcoming album and a concert for next week on Raw. Elias seems kind of like a dum-dum. In round four of the draft, Draft, Raw picks Elias. Makes sense. They also get Lacey Evans from SmackDown and Sheamus as well. Meanwhile, SmackDown finally drafts the Intercontinental Champion, Sami Zayn. Only took two nights and several rounds for that to happen. And they also draft the former SmackDown Tag Champs, Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura. Maybe a reuniting of the Artist Collective? Lana and Natalya take on Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke. Lots of blonde and pink in this matchup. It's an okay match. I'm really impressed with some of the offense that Mandy Rose has throughout, including like kind of like a bounce off the road ropes into an arm drag early on, which is pretty cool. Uh, Dana with a senton off of Mandy's shoulders to win the match. Then afterward, Natalia dumps Lana for losing for their team yet again. So man, poor Lana just cannot keep a partner around these days on TV. Backstage, Ricochet encounters the Hurt Business and makes a challenge to any of them, saying one final match. If Ricochet wins, then this fight between the two sides is done. But if someone from the Hurt Business wins, Ricochet will join the group. Cedric accepts that match. We'll have that later on. On we go to, speaking of another long-running feud that should have ended a while ago, the long-running tag team that never got a catchy name implodes as Andrade takes on Angel Garza with Zelina Vega on commentary. For a blow-off match between two tag team partners. This one is not that great. I mean, it's competitive. It's okay for the most part, but it's just, it's kind of there. It's kind of a match here. Uh, Angel wins the match with the wing clipper, and then afterwards, Lena gets in the ring to check on Andrade when the lights cut out, and then Alexa Bliss and The Fiend appear with a spooky red lighting and the, the backwards bend and everything. Stereo Sister Abby's onto Andrade and Zelina, and that's where the segment ends. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what The Fiend and Alexa will do with this new union on a new show. I think that, you know, maybe they can have hopefully a little more creative leeway and be a bit more macabre now that they're going to be on USA as opposed to Fox. I know a lot of people when The Fiend first moved to Fox, there was a lot of, you know, people hemming and hawing over, oh, he won't be able to do the creepy stuff that he was able to. And like, I think Bray and The Fiend, I think that was still a very good portrayal when he was on Fox. It's crazy. It took an entire year for him to be on SmackDown and finally have a match this last Friday. And it was a good match. And now he's moving to Raw all of a sudden. But I think that, you know, it feels like a bit of a weird drop-off after The Fiend lost the Universal Championship. Like, nothing really came of that. They introduced the Paul Heyman walrus thing, and that has gone nowhere since then. But hopefully, with this change of pace with a new second in Alexa Bliss, maybe this character can recover a bit.
For round five of the draft, Raw selects Nikki Cross, so maybe they'll continue that angle with her and Alexa Bliss. Also, our truth and the first Raw Underground star to be drafted, Dabakato. Meanwhile, SmackDown gets Rugler and Apollo Crews. Back to SmackDown with you, buddy. I actually wrote this down wrong on my notes because I was just getting used to the New Day being the SmackDown Tag Champs, but no, they are the Raw Tag Champs. They're defending against Rugler here tonight, which are a SmackDown team after this show. It's a good match, and I think for, as, for, for considering Xavier Woods was out of action for so many months, and now he's had two high-profile matches, two of two since he's been back. You know, he doesn't look very rusty at all at this point. Uh, there's a blind tag at the end between Kofi and Xavier. Midnight hour to Bobby Roode, and so the New Day retain the championships. Good stuff here. Up next, Ricochet versus Cedric Alexander, and to reiterate, if Rico loses this match, he must join the Hurt Business. The match is okay. Near the end, the referee is taken down. MVP throws a chair into the ring, but Rico intercepts it and pulls the old Eddie Guerrero trick where he pretends to be hit with the chair and pins it on Cedric so he takes a fall and the referee sees that and he disqualifies Cedric. So after weeks and weeks and weeks of the Hurt Business beating the bejesus out of Ricochet and his friends, Ricochet finally wins and gets uh, some comeuppance by doing this sneaky cheating stuff that you know Eddie Guerrero did and everything, but he's a baby face, so it's okay. I, my whole thing was, I don't understand why Ricochet was like, if I beat you, we're done. We're not gonna be fighting each other anymore. All you had to do was not keep poking the bear for week after week, all summer and fall long. In the sixth and final TV round of the draft, Raw picks Titus O'Neil. Yay. Peyton Royce and Akira Tozawa. I was surprised to see on the graphic when they chose him. He's only a five-time 24-7 champion. Meanwhile, SmackDown gets Carmella, which is good because after this draft, I think the whole women's division on SmackDown's been gutted, and Aleister Black. And I was going to say, oh, change of pace for Aleister Black. But then again, he and Kevin Owens are both going to be on SmackDown again, so we'll see. In your main event, it's a dual brand battle royal to see who will face Oscar for the Raw Women's Championship. As the match begins, Nia Jax on the mic saying, okay, everyone knows me or Shayna's gonna win this thing, so why don't you all do yourselves a favor and eliminate yourselves. They're not having it. They all gave up on Nia Jax. We get this stare down between Nia and Tamina, and even if there were a live crowd, nobody would have cared. Shayna ends up helping everyone else eliminate her own tag team partner, Nia Jax, who takes out her frustrations on poor Lana yet again, another Samoan drop to the announce table, once again paying for the sins of Miro. In fact, that should be the name of Lana's like next finisher, the sins of Miro. Anyway, after a while, it's down to Lacey Evans and Natalia. By this point, Asuka has left the announce team and is just watching from backstage. Natalia with one of like the coolest eliminations I've ever seen in a battle royal, where she's got Lacey on the apron in this kind of powerbomb position, hucks her into the ring post, and she just falls from like there onto the floor on her back. So you think Natalia has won, but aha! Lana was never eliminated from that Samoan drop spot. She gets back in the ring, dumps out Natalia, gets a bit of revenge on her former partner and wins the match. What a rib. Between this and the news of Eva Marie coming back to WWE, get these two as the champions, the new two-woman power trip, and just make everyone lose their minds. But enough of that because Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton brawl their way to the ring. It's a continuation of what we saw in the middle of this match. We actually cut away at one point to see them fighting backstage. The thing is pulled apart as we fade to black. I think of all the confrontations and the way they've been building the Orton-Drew feud, this is probably the weakest of what they've done for the last couple of months. And I know you can't be, you know, knocking out of the park every single week, but I feel this one was the least interesting, but we can definitely see there's still the animosity uh, generated from like two or three months of builds, so that's there at least, but I felt that this one kind of felt flat for me. My grade for this week's Raw is a B-. I think for a show that had a lot of storylines in flux slash resetting or starting anew because of the draft, I think it did a good job setting up a lot of those new things for this bold new era of Raw and SmackDown. There were some good matches this week that I enjoyed, some pretty interesting moves and moments with the draft. Just don't ask me to pick which show won the draft this year because chances are in six months it's not going to matter anyway. But let me know what you thought about Raw this week and the draft in general. What move surprised you the most? Let me know in the comments section below. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.